Hi guys, welcome back to the Steve and Sally study. Uh, today is a very, very special day, not only because of my next guest, Gary O'Neill, but more importantly, we are in the first, um, we're in the, 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 the new developed st- uh, studio inside Woodbury House, our podcast studio. So you're the first guest to come on here, Gar- Gary. I feel very privileged, mate. Thank it's you for having me. Not quite uh, Sky Sports, but we're trying to get there. <laughs> ah, it's lovely, mate. Really nice. Artwork's beautiful, isn't it? Thank you very much. Um, Look, thank you for your time. Uh, I know it's been a long time coming. I've been badgering you for a little bit to yeah. come, on, come on board. There's lots I want to talk about. So um, what I normally do is take it right back to the beginning when you were younger. Mm-hmm. Part of my podcast is to give inspiration, education and a bit of motivation to anyone who's maybe looking to get into football, into being an athlete, a business person or just following, following a certain journey. Uh, you guys being athletes have gone through you know ups, downs and I want to find out about how you overcame came that and and so, some tips basically for the audience. So when you were younger then, Gary, I think you're from South London. Yeah, correct. Yeah, from yeah. Bromley. Yeah, born in Bromley. So was it always a your inspiration was always to become a footballer? Uh, yeah, as far as far back as I can remember, I, I wanted to be a footballer. Um, started sort of very young. Obviously, I think nearly every kid's dream at, at that age is is to be a footballer. I know, um, and. Then you, as as time sort of passes and you you get closer and it and it becomes more real, it 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 takes a little bit more attention and effort. But that, those first few years were, were key, just the enjoyment of it, the sacrifices your parents, grandparents, and family members have to make to get you places, and all the stuff that you don't think about when you're a six year old being driven around in a car. But the yeah. sacrifices that everyone else has to make to to get you where you need to be. Yeah. Um, play such a, such a huge part in in your development and and the chances you get. Yeah, so um, I mentioned to you off off camera. I've interviewed a few footballers, mm-hmm. quite a lot of af- athletes now. But the most recent one was uh, Liam Ridgewell, and I asked him the same question, which is this: Obviously, at school, your passion was probably uh, football. Mm-hmm. Um, but was it a little bit difficult to kind of like? You know, you had that, that paradox between I want to become a footballer, but also needed to get the good education, good grades and that kind of stuff. How did you kind of sort of deal with that when you were yeah, younger? Yeah, so um, I, I was okay at school, actually. I found it all fairly, fairly straightforward. I wasn't that someone that had to work overly hard at it. So I was quite, quite fortunate that sort of maths and English and things I, I was okay at. But I think... For the early part, I used to sort of listen to to everybody around me, and I was like, right, I need to. Football is unlikely, as as well as I was doing. It's still unlikely that you make it through. Um, so you you need to make sure that you have some some grades, and you can find another path if if you need to. But then I was because I was sort of thrown into the the first team at Portsmouth like very early. I was sort of playing for the reserves while I was still at school. Travelled with the first team. I remember having to miss maths on a Friday. I had to ask the teacher if I could miss maths to travel with the first team to Nottingham Forest. Um, and then at that point, I did find it very, very difficult to then focus on my schoolwork because the the football was so close that you could almost you could you could grab it, you could feel it was right there. Yeah. And then it, it was very difficult to then go from playing for Portsmouth's first team to going back to concentrating on schoolwork. Mm-hmm. But I think in those early years, I was very good. I was I, I was grounded. I, I had a, a real good sort of circle around me. My, my wife now, who I was with then from the age of from the age of thirteen. Nice. Um, we used to sort of study together. Um, my mum, my dad, everyone was always telling me the importance of education and, and making sure that I was ready in case you you never know you could get an injury, anything could happen. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I was prepared if if it needed to go the other way. Okay. Nice. And um, were your mum and dad then, were they very supportive uh, towards football? Because I'm going to be honest, when I, I was nowhere near the sort of skill set that you you, you, mm-hmm. you had as a young kid as a, being a footballer, but I used to play squash at a fairly high level. Played for Kent, I was Kent champion, South East, yeah. I represented England once. But my mum, was she's quite quite direct and she yeah. says, says things how they are. She said, look, you're probably never going to get to number one. You really need to focus on uh, your your schoolwork, and then after school, maybe look at uh, getting a an apprenticeship, mm-hmm. being a being a plumber. Yep. Which I followed that. Um, how was your mum and dad? I mean, were they saying, "Yeah, go for it," or do you know what? Be a bit conservative with it. Uh, yeah. So they no, they were supportive. I mean, my granddad was had a huge influence on me because my my dad was busy, he worked extremely long hours, um, so he, he was there when he could be at weekends. He used to watch my games and stuff, but it, it was difficult for him to to get me to training and you know when when you're a young kid trying to be a footballer you're basically training six seven nights a week um so it was difficult for him to get me there obviously my mum had had two other children 
Um, and, and they were supportive, but without my granddad, who, who we we lost last year, he was he was a huge huge part to everything I've managed to achieve. I mean, he, he didn't miss anything. If there was if I was playing in the cricket team at school and there was no one else watching, he was stood there watching. He was making sure I got home. Um, we, were, we used to have to get to West Ham, three of us from Bromley after school on on like a Tuesday evening. He used to wait right outside the school gate, take us straight across to Chabaleef, made sure we got everywhere. And then Portsmouth used to run me down to Portsmouth when I went down there. So we, without without my granddad and, and what he sacrificed and gave up to make, make sure I, I got to places, there's... There's absolutely zero chance that, that I would have made it through as a as a professional footballer. So my mum and dad did play a part in the early years. Then 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 they split up when when I got to about 13, 14, and 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 that was a difficult spell for me. But as I said, I've been with my, my wife who's who's been fantastic, and her mum and dad have played a, a huge role as well. One as soon as my mum and dad split up and that became more difficult, I was I was so close to to my wife, my, my girlfriend back then that I sort of they sort of took me under their wing. Yeah. Um offered me completely the same sort of upbringing that, that my wife had had from them. So I've, I've been very fortunate to, to not only have my parents and my grandparents, but my, my wife's parents have also also played a huge part. Yeah, it's definitely testament to the fact that if you've got solid, good relationships around you, whether it's, you know, your soulmate or a friendship or, or business relationships, it's so important. Yeah, yeah them foundations are, are There's key. no way you can do it on your own, especially the, the difficult spells. You know, I remember... Playing for playing for Portsmouth in the early years, and and Harry bringing me off at half time, and we were two 0 down, and the lads went on to win three two. And I, I remember on the, in the car on the way home thinking, I'm not sure this is for me. I'm not sure I'm good enough. And then you have your granddad in the car, and your your wife, and people that can reassure you and make sure you try and stay quite level and help you get back up to where you need to be. So there are so many ups and downs and, and so many challenges that you, you definitely need a, a good support network. Yeah. I feel, I feel as well, if you're uh, in business or if you're an athlete or anyone who's kind of a p- professional, mm-hmm. you're always going to be quite self-critical. Yeah. And it's important to have the granddads and stuff that can look down like a bird's eye view and say, do you know what? Yeah, there's some tweaks you need to make, but actually you're doing really, really fantastic. And I think that kind of that, 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 that support, there is is always going to be key. Yeah, because I, I was, as you say, I was very critical of myself all the time, even even up until when I just finished playing last year. I was always my biggest critic. And you, you do have to have a, a strength inside you that you believe. But I also felt that because I was so critical of myself, it did make me drive myself to, to new levels and make sure I kept progressing rather than standing still. So you, you, you do need an inner strength and, and a drive to keep pushing yourself forward because... <clears throat> As good as your support network is, they they can't do it for you. So they can support you when you need them, but there is something within that you need you need to find that 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 finds your purpose really. Yeah. So um, athletes, they're they're normally people that uh, do not like second place. They do not like losing. Yeah. Um, I know you need that inner strength and stuff, but what other sort of characteristics do you, do you feel that you possess, or what a good footballer or an athlete would have? Because I know you have got to be resilient, you have got to be tough, you have got to be physically strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other things that you 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 believe that you need to have in order to become a top level athlete? Um, you, well, the obvious one is hard work. It, it is hard work. You need to sacrifice things. So I I always worked extremely hard, whether it be a Monday morning training session that didn't really mean a lot. Where, you know, whether it was a recovery session, whether it was a pre season friendly. I always felt like I was I was on show and people were watching. So no matter how important it was to everybody else, I, I wanted to be the best player on the pitch. Obviously, you can't always be the best player on the pitch, but if, if that's your mindset that every time you step over the white line, whether it be football or whether it be business, whatever you're doing, every time you go out to perform, you make sure that you come off feeling like you've done the best you can. That that, that that's the that's the best chance you can give yourself. Yeah. It's also um yeah, but it's being integral, isn't it? If you're going to become a, the best professional you can be, doing everything possible, and like you said, like feeling like you're always being watched. Yeah. Um, I, li- I listen to a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, self-help or um, personal development stuff, and I listened to someone once, and they said, if you just act like there's a camera on you the whole entire time, mm-hmm. from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, think how you would, would perform, how you would act, how you would talk, who who you would affiliate yourself with. And I thought to myself once, actually bang on, because if I acted like that, I would probably get a lot more stuff done. Yeah. I'd become a lot more successful, maybe a lot more wealthier, have be- better relationships. So you feel the accountability side of things really kept you in check? Yeah, and I think 
all of us have slips, you know. There, it, you know, there all there'll be moments in training sessions where I would have gone, you know, what oh, I don't feel like it today, you know. And you're all going to have those slips, but I think if you can then come back off and go right, well, that that wasn't acceptable. That's not what I want to be. That's not that's not good enough. And then you know that you have those levels that you set yourself. You can easily get back on. So I think generally throughout my career, I would say I was proud of how I approached things. But you, you're all going to have slips. It's just how, how you manage to react to them. And I, and I think this is the message that I pass on to the lads at, at Liverpool because they're, they're only sort of 20, 19, um, and they're, they're trying to progress in this game. And you try and get across to them that they're, they're being judged all the time, you know. So we're watching them, whether it be a three v three in training where they think there's no one around, it's just me and the other coach. But we're watching them. We're looking for traits. Do they give up when it's not going well? Do they manage to dig in? You know, how do they react <coughs> when it is going well? Do they get too carried away? So as as a footballer, and, I, and I'm sure in in the industry you're in as well, that you're you're always being judged. Everything you put out there, people are, are looking to cr- uh, critique and criticize and praise and. So you, you you do literally need to need to spend your life like there is always someone watching. Yeah, and um, again, very similar conversations I've had with a lot of my guests, especially athletes. Um, we are in a age now where social media is basically everything. Mm-hmm. Like like it or not, it, we're in this scenario now, and um, I feel that people are always going to criticize you. People are going to hate on you. People are going to troll you every so often. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, I think you're roughly about similar sort of age to me. I'm 34. Yes, slightly older, so I'm 38. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I knew so I knew life before social media, and obviously you did as well. Uh-huh. Um, would you say now people got more pressure as a footballer because of social media, or would you say back then there was more pressure? Uh, no, I think there's more pressure now. I think that the social media is a difficult one. I, I joined Twitter um, while I was at West Ham. Um, and there were positive sides to it. You know, you, you could get the odd free round of golf from somebody or somebody might give you a free set of headphones or some some bits you can use and wear. But the the downside of it, you know, the, the coming off when you've not played so well and it's not gone great and then you're giving people a, a free platform to, to have a dig at you. Yeah. You know, on the bus on the way home, scrolling through hundreds of messages that are, even if there's a few positive ones, you don't see them, you just yeah. see all the negative ones. So, so that can be difficult, and I, I did go through spells in my career where I where I came off it. I left it up, I left it open, but I just came off it and said, "Look, you know what? I feel like this sort of negativity is is affecting the way I approach things." So, I've, I've took myself off, made sure I refocused. So, I, I think it can be very difficult for for players to to deal with that sort of stuff now. Yeah. Um, and and I think probably in. If you had, if you did have a choice, and a lot of them won't have, you'd be better off to stay off it while you're playing. I know there are so much yeah. endorsements and there's things like that that they need to be on it for. But from a strictly performance point of view, I, I think most of the players would would be better off without it. Yeah, like like you just mentioned, it's a bit of a blessing, but as well as a curse. Um, someone like Ronaldo, for example, I think he's one of the, I think he's the highest yeah. followed person in the world with like 150 million people uh-huh. i mean if you really think about that number there's 66 million people in the uk you times up by two that's the amount of people following yeah. on social <laughs> yeah, it's media crazy, yeah. now the benefit of that i saw i don't know how accurate it is and this was about two years ago apparently for a post he would charge something like 350 to four hundred thousand dollars yeah for a post so obviously you can cash in on that it's fantastic the downside is the abuse i mean i've, I've got friends of mine who are you know got a fairly good following and every so often they will get a couple of things that will hit hit them in their heart and it would basically make them depressed for probably a day two days three days and there's nothing really policing that at the moment I know we're talking people are talking about a lot more now Mm -hmm. there's a lot more mental health issues there's sadly people committing suicide because of it because they're not living up to the social media lifestyle yeah um your players obviously they're coming in they're becoming famous they're being recognised on social media. Obviously, they've got money. They're playing for high, you know, uh, high-profile uh, clubs. Is there anything that you say to them and say, like, look, you're going to get this. Be prepared. There's also the ups, but there's going to be the downs on social media. Yeah, I, I haven't had the social media chat yet with with our players. Um, but my, my advice would be very similar to, to what to what I just said to you. I think obviously there's different levels. So once you get to Ronaldo's level, the the obviously the positives far outweigh the negatives I would guess you know a little mm. bit of a, a little bit of abuse here and there for Ronaldo 
whereas you're getting 400,000 and it, probably a lot of the feedback he gets on there is positive anyway. Yeah. So I think there are, there are different levels. I think at, at the <laughs> level I was at and, and the guys that are trying to sort of perform at sort of championship level and, and things and are trying to find their way, maybe the, the negativity outweighs what you're going to get from it sort of po- positive wise. So my, my advice would be if, if you're going to choose to use it, be, be careful. But if you can, I'd, st- I'd stay away from it until you get yourself to a level where it, it becomes a, a benefit to you, really. Yeah. Um, like for, for this, the podcasting stuff, it's been a blessing for me because yeah. I can, back in the day, I've had this conversation a few times now with different people, but back in the day, when I used to see a celebrity, high profile person, business person, athlete, it was almost like, wow, like I've just saw them, I've just met them, it's, it's fantastic. Now I feel like I can reach reach them. Mm-hmm. And even if they don't respond, you feel like you're one or two clicks away from actually communicating with them. And I've thankfully, uh, Liam Ridgewell came came on the podcast because I reached out to him. I've had uh, a Hara Davis boxer, uh, Richie Woodall, uh, yeah. ex-pro boxer, went to Sheffield to the Olympic, um, where they do, do, do all the boxing training up there. Mm-hmm. So it's been really, really good. So when you were younger, obviously with no social media around, what was that like when you started meeting these higher profile footballers? Was it like, did it give you encouragement or was it kind of like nerve wracking to meet them for the first time? Or is it something you didn't really, really think about? No, I, I loved, I love meeting um, sort of high profile footballers. I remember meeting, so I was a big Millwall <laughs> fan growing up. So I remember meeting like Teddy Sheringham and people like that and, I, I used to find it fascinating because I, I knew at that point what I wanted to be, so I was always sort of fascinated by them. I wasn't really in awe of them. I was I, I appreciated that I'd got the chance to meet them, like when I was mascot at Millwall, um, sort of fantastic times that you still have memories of now. Um, but then what, what was strange is then at Portsmouth, when I started playing, Teddy Sheringham was there, you know what I mean? So we had a photo together when I was like four and, and Teddy was like 22, and then we, when we came to the end, I was I then had a photo with him in in the same team. So oh. it is sort of a you do you do come up with some sort of strange scenarios. But yeah, growing up, I I was never really starstruck <coughs> by footballers, um, but always fascinated to sort of try and figure out where they got to, what what they were good at, you know, what what they looked like physically, um, where I needed to get to 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 reach where I want what I wanted to achieve. Um, so yeah, I was I was fortunate growing up that I did have access to to a lot of football matches, and um, we got goes back to the family. They they did put me in situations that definitely helped me help me develop. Yeah, and I've, uh, just sort of running off on the this social media part, but like back in the day, you would only hear about footballers really in in the news, papers, radio, that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, sometimes the media. I mean, we were just talking about COVID and it's a similar sort of subject, but they have a way of purporting certain things or creating a narrative. Mm-hmm. So you get, so you might see a a footballer and you think, oh, I don't know if I like that person mm-hmm. just because the way they've been they've sort been of presented. Yeah, yeah. But the moment that you actually communicate with them on social media, it's a completely different different sort of person. And when I met all these other people who've been on my podcast, I always think, you know what? They're nothing like how I thought they were going to no, be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think social media can allow you to be you, and you can demonstrate who you are. What was what is media like, Chloe? Like the typical papers and stuff. I mean, do you ever get pissed off a little bit that they say certain things, or you just try and block that out as well? Yeah, no, I try and I try and block it out. I think um, there, there's always a few articles where you feel things that have been said about you are unfair and, and don't represent it, and misleading. Yeah, and don't represent exactly how it was and, and how it happened, but. Um, I think I think that that is the positive thing about social media. It does give people an opportunity to to feel like they're involved and reach out, and you can speak to you can try and speak to some of the big stars, and sometimes you get a response. And as you say, it's opened up things for you for for next gen, for example. Yeah. Social media has give us a fantastic platform to yeah. to go out and advertise and let people know what we're about and what we're doing. So that there are definitely positives to it. Um, and media wise, I mean, they've they've been good to me. Really, I was never, I never got myself in too much trouble or put myself in situations where I was sort of leaving myself open to be to be shot at. Really, but I can understand for some people who do make mistakes and maybe have have put themselves in situations that the media make it even even more difficult for them than than it than it would be. And I think you look at the England team and some of the pressure that they have put on them probably affects the the performances negatively sometimes mm-hmm. um but as you say it's it's sort of pass and parcel really part and parcel you don't 
we, when you're not going to be able to change that. So if you're a young aspiring athlete or businessman or artist, whatever you want to be, you can't change what other people are going to do. All you can make yourself is resilient enough to be able to know these problems are out there, know the, that social media is there and there's positives, but there are also negatives and that the media, you're not going to change what they do, but can you cope with it? Can you make sure you put yourself in a, in a right frame of mind to be able to deal with, with what's thrown at you really? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, for me, I would have loved to have been a footballer, but I was no uh-huh. way ever in, in on the, on this on this earth ever going to be a footballer. But part of it was traveling the world, playing for great f- football, uh, great teams, mm-hmm. being fit. I mean, I, I I live in the gym. I like I like to box. I've yeah. competed a few times. I've done different kind of sports and stuff. But then also the money. Money's always been fantastic. When mm-hmm. I was younger, it was fantastic. But now it seems to be on another level. Yeah. The challenges with that, though. Mm-hmm. So if you're young, let's just say you come from a typical normal background, let's say middle class, or you might even come from a deprived background and yeah. you suddenly enter into a life where you're getting 50, 100, 200, 300 grand a week. That in itself is a big challenge because how do you stop a young guy going out there and splashing all the cash on the wrong stuff? How do you kind of mould that person to become almost a sensible kind of business person and keep keeping yourself quite humble and level-headed? Yeah, I think I think it's a challenge. I think I, I speak to so many footballers or ex-footballers that have, have wasted a, a lot of what they've earned and, and not through being silly, just from sort of poor advice, really. You know, you even, even if I take myself as an example, so I, I come out of school, um, at 16 my, my mum and dad have split up so I I don't I don't see as much of them as as I used to I'm living away in Portsmouth um your phone starts ringing like agents wanting to represent you I'm, I'm a 16 year old I'm straight out of school I, I, I have no idea how to choose the best agent which one's got my best <coughs> interest at heart which one hasn't you know so you end up making all these decisions on your own and there's financial advisors and they want to put your money into these things but these guys are sort of 40s 50s they've lived life they know how the world works you're 16 17 straight out of school a lot of big decisions to make at a very very young age so a lot of the the people I've seen who sort of fall into these sort of pitfalls are are not ones that are out there spending money on on stupid cars and hundreds of thousands on nights out and things these are people that have trusted people within and and just weren't ready to make those sort of decisions and and you're putting your trust in in the wrong people at young ages so I think it's very very difficult I think obviously there are there are sort of unions and things in place who try to help but it it is very very difficult I mean for for everyday people out there they they won't under they 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 won't appreciate and and rightly so really they think oh well you're you're 18 years old someone's giving you 50 grand a week what what you're moaning about and you're like yeah that, that that's fine but we're all, all we're trying to make people aware of is that there are pitfalls out there and it's not as straightforward as as you'd think you know you go from from school or college or whatever it was to being on that sort of money there are a lot of decisions to make yeah um so yeah i think i think maybe there there can be better things put in place for for some of the younger players i know the pfa try to help um but a, a lot of people i've i know now who you think have had fantastic careers maybe aren't in the position that, that they would have been because you, you get a lot you get the most of your money when you're still very very young mm. um i think if if you were a professional footballer from the age of 30 to 45 you would spend your money a lot differently than yeah. it, that you do than if you're from 18 to 30 so there, there are challenges and i think as, as with everything really education is key and trying to educate the players at, at a very young age that they need to look after it because it, it doesn't go on forever yeah um, I had Anton Ferdinand on my podcast and he, he was telling me about some of the challenges uh, circulating money, not specifically with him, but he said there was a few football clubs where there was so-called financial advisors or agents mm-hmm. going in there promoting a certain product and that product after a couple of years was non-existent and it went down heavily. Mm-hmm. And he was saying that he wants to set up his own kind of academy where it helped footballers to get them financially educated. And I think... It's more than just being a footballer these days. You need to be into your wellness. You need to be into your strength and conditioning, your recovery, as you said, mm-hmm. um, eating the right uh, superfoods. Then also you need to get educated on social media, whether you can, um, you know, how to promote yourself and maybe get endorsements like that. And then obviously thinking about your your career or your life beyond football. Yeah. So the difference between an asset versus a liability and these are all kind of things that I don't think schools have really caught up with that yet. 
and certain sports careers, I don't think enough has been sort of implemented. And that's what he he said he wanted to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. I think um, there, there are lo- loads of stories you hear of people at certain clubs who have been put into things that, that, that they regret, um, that they, they, they felt was the right thing to do at the time. Um, and and that, that's sort of part of the journey I want to go on with, with Next Gen. So it's sort of a... We take these kids from very, very young, but if, if they are successful and they do start to get to, then there will definitely be a few hours in the classroom that we can also offer them. You know, everyone thinks we're just teaching them to control the ball, pass it, move, dribble. <coughs> if they start to be successful and it looks like they may then have a career in this, there's definitely things there that we can offer that I wish that would have been there for me when I was at that age, you know, because yeah. like you say... I went into it completely cold. You know, I've studied maths and English and science and then someone starts paying you 10 grand a week and you're like, well, what, what do I do with this? You know, do I just yeah. leave it in my bank? Or this guy who's 45 says he's got a good idea. He wants to do this with it. You're like, well, he, he seems like a nice guy. I'll let him look after me. Yeah. But it's, it is very, very difficult. Um, so I think there is definitely a place, as Anton says, for educating these players. You know, they're, they're probably at clubs now from 16 to 18 where they go and do sort of a college day. I think there's definitely room in there for education about your money. And people think you play football till you're 35, and, and generally you do. But the money isn't the same all the way through. So it will go up to a certain point. And then those last few years after 30, you're, you're generally not earning what you were. So you do need to try and prepare and get yourself in a position as early as you can that you're not then reliant on getting that next contract. Can I get the same as what I was earning before? Yeah. You, know, you need to try and live make sure this contract sets me up. Anything I get after this is, is a bonus. So there's there's loads that, that can be done definitely to help young people and, and, and not only in football, in, in, in all walks of life because there are, as you say, there are pitfalls to, to being successful. People are out there trying to trying to make money off you as well. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to talk about Next Gen uh, a little bit more in depth, but I was going to leave it slightly to the back yeah, of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, no but on this note of uh, your, your, your career, um I've seen now there's a bit of a culture that towards the end of players' careers, and this didn't happen when I was younger, maybe you can correct me, but they now fly over to Russia, mm-hmm. China, America, um, UAE, and it seems like they get like a second wind where yeah. they start earning fantastic amount of money. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a Chelsea fan, and I remember, I think it was Etu, mm-hmm. went to Russia, I think before he actually come to Chelsea, actually. Yeah. And he was on something fairly, fairly ridiculous for considering he was a lot older. I think yep. it was like 300 or 400 grand a week or yeah. something. Um, that must be quite exciting though for certain players. Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, I you, generally you have to be in the very sort of top bracket to get offered. I mean, you see the deals in America for the marquee players, you know, the Beckhams and, and people like that. Um, I know Liam... The guy Liam Ridgewell you had on yep. recently, he had a little spell out there. He was he did very well to get a, to get a deal of that of that sort of level out there because they're not easy to come by. You generally need to be sort of a a, a home like a, a name brand really, where people everyone knows you to get those sort of contracts. And is it fair to say as well that uh, it's unusual for let's say a goalkeeper or a defender usually to get them? It's normally a midfielder or a striker yeah. because they that's what they pay the money for. So. Yeah, sort of shirt sales. You know, yeah. they want to sell shirts off the back of it and. They're trying to improve their brand, really. So I think those opportunities are good. I, I never really had one. I came close. I spoke to sort of a team in America once when I was leaving West Ham, but felt it was a little bit early in my career to be to be going. I wanted to still do a bit in England. Um, but there are the opportunities. But what, what I'd say is you, you don't want to be in a position at 32 where you need to leave your family to go yeah. to Israel because someone's willing to pay you loads of money. You know, if you want to, you want to, but you want to get yourself in a position where you can say, well, actually, I'd rather stay and see my two kids grow up, take yeah. them to school, go to training locally, still earn a decent amount of money here. But you, I, I, I wouldn't want to be in a position where I felt like I had to go and do that because I was reliant on earning that sort of money still. Yeah, of course. Um, so the, I think the early part, and as you say, education for players is is key. Definitely. So just talking about your career then. So coming out of school, what was your first kind of break? What would you say was was like a, a moment where you thought, you know what, I'm on the right path here? Yeah, so I, I got fortunate really. I was, at, I was at West Ham sort of 13 years old, doing okay, sort of just like one of the crowd, sort of, sort of holding my own, but not doing anything crazy special. Um, and then Terry Fennick, um, I don't know if you know Terry Fennick, he played for... 
I think he played for England for a while. He managed Portsmouth. His son played for my Sunday team. Um, and while we were there, I was at West Ham. He said his dad got the Portsmouth job. And there was a few of us in that Sunday team that were not bad. So he said, how do you feel about coming down, play for the under 14? So a few of us went down. I got on really well with the, the youth team coach. And then I started to outperform a lot of the guys who I was seen as the same as for some reason, whether it was because I felt at home there, got on well with a coach. I started to progress quicker. Um, and then, as I said, I was sort of thrown into the reserves as a 15-year-old still playing at school. Um, made my debut at sort of 16 for Portsmouth. And it was at that point, really, where at sort of 14, I didn't realise, I didn't think I was going to make it still. I still felt it was like a dream. Mm-hmm. And then at 15, when I started playing for the reserves, I was playing a, alongside senior pros, and I realised that, you know what, actually, I think I, I can do this. Um, so at 15, it started to be become more of a reality and and I felt like there was something I could achieve um and it's interesting because you said earlier about being your own biggest critic and and even now I look back and I think I still think I underachieved I still think I could have got a little bit more out of myself whether it would have been the the, I had a nasty injury at West Ham or maybe I shouldn't have took a certain move I should have gone somewhere else so even now, I, I, I had a I had a fairly successful career played in in the Premier League for for a number of years. Still now looking back at Gary O'Neill, the footballer, I think maybe I, maybe I could have squeezed a bit more. You know, maybe I could have got to one of them big clubs. Maybe I could have got closer to the England team. Hmm. Um, so that and that will never stop. And I am extremely <clears throat> grateful for the chances I was given and, and what I achieved. But still, being being the way I am, I still wish I could have got that little bit more out of myself. So the, the 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 amount of clubs that you played for, I, I mean, I was having a look, but mm-hmm. how, how many of them ha, ha, has there been? Um, oh, I, I don't know exactly. So if we run through them, I was Portsmouth, then went Walsall on loan, Cardiff on loan, moved to Middlesbrough, so that's four, uh, moved to West Ham, five, QPR, six, Norwich, seven, Bristol City, eight, Bolton, nine. So wow. I think, I, I don't think I've missed anybody out there. Apologies yeah. if I have. I think I played for nine clubs, sort of, 230-ish Premier League games, 300 in the, uh, 250 in the Championship, sort of a few in FA Cups and obviously played for England under-21s, um, captained the England under-20s in, in the World Cup in Dubai, which was an amazing achievement. Um, but it, it was just things like that, you know, being in and around the England team as a young lad and then not quite managing to make the grade, which which is the biggest step up, you know, to go from yeah. 21s to the full squad is a big step. Um and maybe physically I wasn't quite good enough. I was never that quick, never that strong. Um, and people will maybe look at it and say, I got the most out of myself. But I still wonder whether I had whether I'd been a bit wiser when I was younger and I'd, I'd have known and been given some of the tools that the lads are given nowadays, whether I could have just got that little bit extra out of myself. But yeah, very, very, very appreciative of the of the career I've had and played for some fantastic clubs. Um, I was going to say, which has been your favourite club you've played for? Um, I loved my time at Portsmouth because I was sort of a baby when I got there and came all the way through and they helped me develop into the the player that, that I sort of became really. Um, but then also West Ham, I didn't realise what, what a big club it was in, until I arrived. You know, I was at, I was at Middlesbrough um, and when West Ham came in for me, I was like, oh yeah, great, it's sort of back, back home. You know, I can move back to Bromley, family can settle. Um, but then when I got there, that it was it was a huge club. I, I didn't realise there was always people at training, watching. Which there wasn't any of the other clubs I've been at. Um, there was a huge expectation for us to to compete at the, the sort of the top half, top end of the Premier League, um, and there still is that now. So probably Portsmouth uh, and West Ham. But then, like when 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 I think of the spell I had at Norwich, very appreciative of that because. It sort of seemed like my time had passed in the Premier League. I, I dropped down to the Championship with QPR, had a nasty injury at West Ham on my ankle, never quite got back to the same level. But then at, at Norwich, we got promoted and I managed to play 30-odd games in the Premier League. Got on fantastically well with everybody. So to, I appreciated that because I was older and I realised that it wasn't going to go on forever by that point. So to get another crack at the Premier League at that stage, I was very grateful to the to the club and Alex Neal, the manager, and, and the fans who... I got on fantastically well with. So there are little bits from from sort of every club, but I spent a lot of time at Portsmouth. They helped me grow, and 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 West Ham was 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 such a big club that that I really enjoyed my time there as well. So I take it every time you went to another club, then your your family had to move with you. 
Yeah, that was pretty much how it works. Until the latter stages where, um, obviously, I've got three children. My eldest, uh, Summer May, is in Sylvia Young Theatre School up here, so in, in central London. So she then, it becomes difficult to move mm. her because there's not too many of them schools around. You di- you disrupt her whole sort of life if you move her away from here. So when, when I went to Bristol City, for instance, I sort of travelled a bit, stayed in hotel when I needed to, came back when I could. Bolton bought like a season ticket on the Virgin train and used to travel sort of Houston to, to Bolton nearly every day. Wow. Um, which was, which was a long slap, but because it was on the train, I actually felt okay. Um, the manager, Phil Parkinson was great. Used to look after me. Obviously I was a bit older, so I, I, I still trained hard, but on the Monday I would need an extra recovery day and things anyway. So made it work. Okay. Really fond of, of my spell there as well we, we got relegated in the end but considering what we were up against that year with the financial restraints and things we had a, a right good crack at it I managed to win player of the year in, in my last ever season playing professional football so sort of fond memories every year everywhere but you I mean you get fantastic rewards and I've had a fantastic life and, and, and earned money that I never dreamed I would be able to earn growing up um, but there are bits of it where you don't get to see your family a lot, you know. I've I've made a lot That's of sacrifices. Sacrifice, yeah, yeah, I've made some sacrifices along the way, and and of course they're worth it because of the the life I can I can give my family and what and what I can provide for them. Um, but it isn't it isn't always as simple as people see from the outside. It's like oh well, you're getting paid a lot of money, just pick them up, take them down to Bristol with you. I'm like well, yeah, but they've got a life as well. Mm. You know, I can't expect them to just live my life yeah. with me. You know, my little girl. After I've finished playing, she needs to have her own career. She needs to build her own thing. Um, so there's all these decisions that you need to weigh up. Um, and, and in the main, I feel like I, I did did the best for for the family and and for myself, my career, and tried to always get the balance as as, as sort of well as I could. Yeah, and uh, a little bit on the the sacrifice uh, part. So <clears throat> as again watching different sports uh, evolve and uh, certain things are enhanced, including football, the training, strength, conditioning and the wellness side of it, which is the recovery and also your nutrition. I'm looking at uh, people like Ronaldo, going Mm -hmm. back to him. I mean, obviously he's getting older, but he seems like he's getting better as time goes on. Um, Obviously, a part of that is going to be down to, you know, his skill, everything Mm -hmm. else and his determination. Mm -hmm. But have you seen a massive change in like how players are developed in regards to their fitness their strength their durability and also what they're eating what they're consuming yeah i think it's it's i mean it's completely changed i mean when i broke in um no disrespect to the guys that were playing them but they were they were just sort of normal guys a lot of them were overweight <coughs> they did they just happened to be good at football they weren't really athletes you know that portsmouth team i broke into were just a, a group of of normal men that were that were good at football and then it, it seemed to be, you know, like the Thierry Henry started turning up. Obviously, Arsene Wenger had a big part to play in it. Um, and when I think of the advice and stuff that I was given, you know, and what I used to do as a young pro to prepare myself, it's nowhere near what the guys get given now. You know, the access to stuff that the guys that, that I work with at Liverpool have, you know, they have everything. They have nutritionists. They have advice on, on what they should eat, when they should eat it, what when they should rest, when they should recover. Um, you get all your sort of stats back from training, what sort of numbers that the first team will be hitting, what you need to be hitting to get yourself there. There's I mean, a lot of science behind it. Yeah, there's an awful lot of science, stats, advice. Whereas when I was coming through, you know, we would, uh, the lads do a lot of core now. That, was, that wasn't even a word. You know, people used to just throw a medicine ball at your stomach while you were laying on the floor. That was yeah. what we used to do to, to make our stomach strong, you know. And there is still a place for that because it hardens you and it, it yeah. gets you ready for... But there's a lot more that goes into it now, and the level has gone up. You know, you it is a it is a game for athletes now. Yeah. Football, whereas it was, as I say, when I sort of broke in, it was a a game for for sort of normal men that were talented. Yeah. Um, whereas now I feel like it's completely changed, and you, you have to be athletic. You need to be extremely. You need to be able to cope with the athletic side of it to be able to bring your sort of skills and things to the table now. Yeah. And R- Ronaldo is a fantastic example because. Obviously, he is hugely, hugely talented, um, and he has got things that he's sort of been born with, and a lot of it is genetics. But he's also brought the side of it where he doesn't leave any stone unturned, and he he makes sure that he's going to get the best out of himself. He's, he lives the life, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, he's 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 got a lot of money that that helps him, but he's he didn't have to put a cryo chamber in his house. You know, yeah. one of the things that drops to 140 degrees that helps you recover. 
So he's he's done everything that he can to make sure that he can play at the top level for as for as long as he can. So he's he's a fantastic example for everyone growing up, not only because he's one of the best to ever play the game, but the way he approaches it and how he's sacri- made sacrifices to get where he is. It's almost a difference between being a really good footballer and earning really good money and probably winning certain things or becoming a superstar. And it's normally that 5 or 10% extra that you do, which is, might not be actually the football. It might be everything that you're doing around the football, which is the nutrition, recovery, etc., which takes you from you know, here to here, basically. And I think um, it seems like a lot more people are doing it. And because of social media, it's being highlighted a lot more. And there's more of a culture now. And I remember reading Sir Alex Ferguson's book. I forgot the name of it now. Um, It will come to me. But he said when he first joined, it was either... It was either Man United or the team before, which was in Scotland, which was Aberdeen. Aberdeen. They were... A lot of them were drunks. Like, they kept on drinking all the time. Yeah. He basically said, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to sack everyone in this team and restart again. No one believed him. And then he went on this cull where he was like, got rid of like eight players straight away. Yeah. And I think people like him really drilled it into players that this isn't a muck about. This is, you know, you don't get, this is not rehearsal. You've got one shot at it. Yeah. And I think, I think uh, becoming that, you know, rigid kind of professional and being obsessed with, being the best you can be is kind of the only way to be if you're going to be the absolute best. Yeah, it's true. It's, it has completely changed. We used to train sort of ten thirty till twelve thirty, and, and and that was it. The lads, if they wanted to drink, would then be off down the pub, sort of socialising. It was seen as sort of team spirit and togetherness, but there was no way it was good for you as as an athlete, which which we which we were supposed to be. Um, my sort of I came just after that, so it was sort of dying out as I came into it. So I've sort of lived through both both parts of it. That end where you had those sort of old school people who would train for an hour and a half, get a sweat on, then go and have a drink um, all day and then think, oh, actually, it, do- it doesn't matter that I've had a drink because I'll just sweat it out in the morning. We'll have a run around. We'll have a five aside. Mm. And, and, and that was how it was back then. Um, and the change is it's just been so, it's so radical where we are now to where we was when I first started. It's almost a completely different game and you can see by the speed it's played at now yeah you watch some of the old footage they, they were fantastic footballers but it looks like it's sort of in in slow motion compared to where we are now yeah um and also that i mean a great a great friend of mine one of my old coaches used to say you know what what you do in the dark will will, will be seen in the light and that's you sort of get that impression from ronaldo yeah that he, he doesn't just work hard because people are watching you know, when, when he's at home on his own, in his own gym, you, you can pretty much guarantee that he's putting the work in because he knows what he's doing. He doesn't need everyone to see him. Mm. He knows what he's going to get from it. So like, like we said at the start, really, making sure that you're you're always trying to get the best out of yourself. So you know when, when you get to my age now and it and it's all behind you and you've you've had your go at it, did I get the best out of it? I could. And, and to be able to sit here and say, yeah, pretty much, I think I gave all I could. There's not a lot more I could have done. Is, is all you can ask of yourself, really. Yeah. Just before we talk about uh, what you're doing right now and ev- everything else, I, it's something that I, I've always been um, fascinated with high profile kind of people, athletes or people that have been on TV, etc. Do you know what, what is it like, like day to day when like you go into a restaurant now or you go into a bar or you go away on a holiday? Obviously, it's a bit like the social media question, I guess, where people will kind of approach you. And obviously, you're going to be nice people. There's going to be bad people. Have you had any moments where it's like, fuck off, mate, like stop stop pestering me? Or is there been any weird moments where people have like challenged you on certain things? What's, what's that been like? Yeah, there's been so... I've had a few, really. I mean, not, not so much now, because once you stop playing, people sort of... You're not quite as in the limelight as you sort were. Sort of blend back into yeah. the society. Almost. Um, obviously, I'm I'm working at a big club in Liverpool, so so when I, when I'm up there, I still get noticed a little bit. Um, but I've had a few sort of after games. Obviously, my spell at Bolton, I used to get the train home, so we played Leeds. We played Leeds United away. Well, cool, um, you're getting the same train as the, the fans. Yeah, so I'm straight from Leeds, straight from Ellen Road to Leeds train station to get the train back to London. Um, Leeds, Leeds had battered us. We'd, we'd lost anyway. We put up a good fight, but I think we lost 2-1. <coughs> I was just stood in the queue waiting for my, my train ticket and this Leeds fan with his girlfriend come up to me and said, started saying some not so nice things, you know. So I'm like, oh, like come on, mate. You, you beat us anyway. Like You're, you're going to go up. We're having a tough time. Like, congratulations. Yeah. And, then, and he starts to be a little bit over the top and yeah. you're like, 
it, it starts to get a little bit close together and then you end up having people to get involved and you're like, I'm just trying to get, I've, all I've done is a day's work and I'm just trying to get myself home. Yeah. And this guy wants to come and have a fight with me because I play for Bolton. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it is crazy some of the situations. And on the, obviously I got sent off against Derby in the playoff final for QPR. So Derby fans are, are not too fond of me because the QPR ended up going up and, and Derby didn't. Um, and then I got a train home from a Bolton game, not even playing against Derby, but there were some Derby fans on the train. And they knew I was I was obviously sat behind them, so they were like talking to each other, but just talking about me, like they pretended I didn't that they didn't know I was there. Inadvertently saying yeah. stuff. So, to so you, what but, about that yeah. Gary O'Neill? I can't believe he's not finished yet. You know, he was he was useless at the bit that sort of thing, but with some more choice language that I won't use on the podcast. Um and you, I just sort of sat there with my headphones on and you sort of you have a you have a decision to make there, and it's like, well, do you know, I, I don't think this guy should be allowed to sit there and talk talk about me like that. So you yeah. either take your earphones off and you confront him, or you just sit back in your chair and you and you try and rise above it. At that time, I had enough, so I said, uh, you know, I'm here, mate. Yeah, do, have you got something to say? And then they, in, normally they go a little bit quiet and they, they sit back down. Um, but generally, people are nice, um, and you get a lot of people from the clubs I've played for that come up to you on holidays, you say and say, ah. Oh, thanks for what you did in this game or in that game or oh, we loved you at Norwich and things like that. Um, but you do get the occasional one where where people just want to be a pain for no reason and feel like it's their little moment to to, to shine. Um, but I, I always try and deal with it the best I can and try and keep my, my sort of temper intact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it must be tough. If so, Especially if someone says something really personal, like outside of football to you, it's just no need for it. Yeah, just especially when you sat there, mind, do you know what I mean? You're minding your own business. You think, you know, what? all I've done is I've gone and played a game of football. Like That's, that's my job. Yeah. What pe- People go to work. I'm just trying to get the train home. Sat here eating my sandwich with my ear- headphones on, watching a bit of Netflix. And this guy wants to wants to start a rap with me. But it, it is part, it's part and parcel of what you have to deal with. And, and like you say, for anyone coming up, is looking to be successful. There are are always people that, that want to take a take a swipe at you. Not too many. Generally, people are, are nice and and they congratulate you on on what you've achieved and what you've done. But there are a few. So just just be careful, guys out there. If you if you're in situations, try and deal with them in the best way possible. For sure. So um, your your football career. Um, I know you said that the when I was speaking to you before we we came on, uh, you had a few in- injuries, including mm-hmm. the Achilles. Is yeah. that what kind of finished the career? Yeah, or so was I, you thinking about it anyway? Uh, I was always thinking about it. I knew I knew I wanted to manage and coach afterwards. Um, but my my year at Bolton, I did so well physically and and played so well that ev- everyone there, managers, players. I was thirty six when I left, but they they all knew that I had like years left in me. It looked like I had a good three or four years left. Started to get a little bit of pain in my Achilles, and then um, while trying to stay fit on my own, really trying to find another club. It, it ruptured um and then it's it's just it sort of then the Liverpool thing came about and it was like if if I want to keep playing I've got to f- come back from this which is going to be probably over a year and then I'm going to end up lower down because I've been through this you know so short term I'd have loved to have had another few years at playing but it, it would have been lower down um and to get the opportunity to go in at a club like Liverpool from our first coaching job especially with with such a sort of an older age group you know I haven't had to go in right down at the bottom at the yeah. lower end of the academy to go in with the under-23s, um, work with Barry Lutus, who's such an experienced coach. The the first team are sort of very hands-on with what we do, so I get passed down a, a lot of stuff that... I mean, I've, I've been there sort of two, three months, but I've I've learned so much. I'm yeah. also seeing it, sort of seeing it as my sort of <coughs> university, really. I'm sort of studying while I'm there. I'm sort of like, this is, this is what I want to do, but this is where I learn. Um, and of course, there's bits that I can pass on to the young lads, as we're sort of talking about now. Those those guys in Liverpool's youth team are going to face the same sort of challenges that, that I faced, and I've already been there and, and done it. Um, hopefully, they can do it at an even higher level. But I can definitely share some of my experiences to to sort of help help guide them. Um, but yeah, injuries injuries are tricky. You know, they, they they did definitely play a part in in the latter stages of my career, and I had to adjust how I played and. Um, couldn't do things that I used to be able to do, but you, like, like I've said, you, you need to find a way to to be able to adapt and, and adjust. Um, and they, they did they did probably bring my playing career to an end slightly shorter than I thought. I'd probably get to forty if I'm honest. The way I felt at, at Bolton, good. Um, but to have to have been fortunate enough to go, as I say, go straight in at Liverpool is a is a huge huge blessing. 
So, uh, so how did you kind of uh, now that position there? Because I know you've done that. You had a stint of doing like more media stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like a lot of footballers, even in their career, when they when they're not playing, sometimes they get invited on. Is that yeah. just a natural thing that they just offer it to you all the time, or do you have to really put yourself forward and say, right, I want to do this. I want to speak about this team or this situation or that manager. Mm-hmm. Um, is it is it like I said? Is it a natural progression, or is it something you need to put yourself forward for? I think when when you're playing, you get the odd opportunity to go on to things, and and they want you on. But then as you sort of come to the end, and then it becomes, I I then started seeking it because I, at the end of my playing career, I thought, look, I, I want to coach and I want to manage, but it's an extremely um, difficult industry to to get into. You know, it's very competitive. There's only one manager for each team, whereas yeah. there's like twenty players, so it's not easy. Um, so I thought, you know, if I can do a little bit of the media stuff, so I started getting onto talk sport when I could. Um, tried to get onto things while I was still playing, while you're still sort of relevant. Um, and then Sky sort of comes about. And so that media year really wasn't really planned. It was sort of like I'd done a little bit of prep for it, but because of the injury, I couldn't coach, I couldn't play. Um, so I was fortunate enough that people like Sky and TalkSport like, liked me enough to, to give me a go. Um, and I'm definitely going to keep it going, still doing bits of it now, because although it was never the, the plan, I've, re- I've enjoyed it far more than, than I thought I would. Yeah. Um, so I have really enjoyed it. Um, and then the, the Liverpool thing was just sort of a little bit of luck and a, a little bit of, of knowing a few people there already. I was sort of... Uh, there was a few lower league managers jobs coming vacant and I wanted to send my CV in for them. Um, but I knew a guy at Liverpool, so I sent in my CV because obviously I'd never done one. So I was like, this is my CV, mate. Do, what do you think of it? Is it? Can I send this to places like Bolton and or is, or is it rubbish? Do I need to get someone else to do it? So that was the idea. I never heard back from him, actually. It was like, a, but I thought, oh, he's, he's busy. So I just cracked on with my CV. How it was. And then about six weeks later, the, the head of the academy at Liverpool rang me and said, oh, you're... Your CVs ended up on my on my desk. We'd we'd love you to come up for a chat and nice, and that was it really. And then I didn't know whether COVID was going to sort of scupper it because you know that they, they, they might have been yeah. making a few sort of redundancies and they might restructure. But but luckily the position I was going for was sort of kept and they've they've kept an under twenty three as assistant manager and and I've managed to to find myself to find myself at one of the biggest clubs in the world at sort of a very young age coaching yeah. wise so so hopefully I can use it to, to my advantage and provide a, a fantastic service to the to the lads at Liverpool and benefit everyone involved so you're looking after the under 21s or is it academy under 23s, yeah okay under 23s yeah cool and your ambition is to eventually get to a first team management role yeah uh, ideally where would you like to be um I, I don't mind really. I mean, I'm going to set my sights on the biggest one. So I'd love to one day manage England. Obviously, I never played for them and, and very unlikely. You know, normally it's a, as we've seen, either a, a very talented, well known foreign manager or a former England player. Um, you do you do get the odd one that, that didn't have a, a, a top, top playing career that manages to, to find their way through. Um, so I, I set my sights at wanting to be the best. English manager around that, that that's my aim at the moment um, obviously it's a long way off and so someone actually once said to me that if if you can see all the steps to get you to your goal then your goal is not big enough you know you if you, you're supposed to not be able to see how you get there do you know what yeah. I mean so that, that's where I am at the minute I can see the first few steps of the ladder and then it all sort of gets a bit blurry as I get up a bit further up but that that that's definitely right up there and, and I want to I want to be at the top of the Premier League. I want to manage big clubs. Obviously, very difficult for English managers. You don't see many of them getting big jobs. Frank Lampard's obviously doing Chelsea, but yep. majority of them are still done by foreign managers. So, so can I break into that? Obviously, there's there's a lot of steps to go, but I'll, I'll continue to keep working hard and trying to improve myself, constantly learning, um, and see see how far up the the ladder I can get. Yeah, I I think uh, Frank Lampard's a really really uh, good one because. Um, there's a lot of, I would imagine, if you were a fantastic footballer, obviously Lampard for Chelsea was a legend mm-hmm. um, and obviously scored all the goals mm-hmm. and he's, you know, took them to premiership uh, winners a few times and also Champions League, etc. Yeah. Is there a massive expectation, a lot of pressure on you as a player if you can convert over to a manager? If they, if they see you as a phenomenal footballer, most fans are probably going to say, well, he's got to be a good manager then. Yeah. Is that transition completely different mindset? What what goes into that? 
Yeah, so it is completely different. Obviously, football, um, uh, we've we've sort of covered all of it, really. You're you're looking after yourself and trying to look after every part of yourself and make sure you're ready to perform at the, at the weekend. Um, coaching side of it is sort of a far sort of broader f- spectrum and you're trying to look after lots of different things and all the other individuals that come under your, make sure they're all right. It's no longer about yourself, really. It's about... I need to get the best out of this lot now. I no, no longer need to get the best out of me. It's this group of players I need to get the best out of. So very, very different. Um, and the sort of tactical side of it, I've always studied and been aware of and feel like I'm, I'm quite strong in those departments. But but what I'm learning now from speaking to leaders of, of all different businesses, not just football. So we I know we're off, off air. We spoke about Paul Wedgwood recently, the yeah. former owner of Splash Damage. <clears throat> I spend hours with him about hopefully how... Hopefully my next guest. Yeah, hopefully we'll get him on for you. Um, I'll speak to him about how he gets the best out of the people that work for him, you know, and yeah. how he got his business to, to where it got to. Um, read lots of books, listen to sort of audio books on the way up and down the motorway, trying to figure out how to get the best out of people because it's, it's fine. I can figure out which formation will work best and what we should do from a corner and, and how it all looks on paper. But how do I get this group of players to, to try and pull up trees for me? Do you know? How do I get them to buy in and, and be part of what we're trying to achieve? Because it football's an interesting one because it's it's a team game, but it's it's full of like individual sort of commodities, really. They're all their own little business. All yeah. to, but you need to get them all to try and come together and achieve achieve one goal. Um so there's there's so many different factors to it. And that, and that that's what I find fascinating, really, that I can keep learning and keep trying to develop myself to to improve other people. So, yeah, we were talking about uh, managers and uh, we were talking about uh, Frank Lampard at Chelsea. Um, as I mentioned, my brother works at, at, at Chelsea. He's an absolute fanatic. And um, he knows all the stats. He knows everything that goes on uh, on over there. He said that he's um, uh, spent over 300 million, I think. I think it's one of the biggest records in the history of the mm-hmm. Premier League. And from an outsider, including me, slightly, you would assume that if you're going to spend all that money on these phenomenal players, obviously they're going to win the Premier League. But we've seen in history before that it doesn't always work like that. So as a manager, that skill set that you need to develop, which is looking at players' personalities, looking at their skill set, looking at how they work with certain other players who have got maybe different skill sets. How, 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 do, how do you learn that, that skill? How do, you, how, do you, how do you sort of systemize a team in your own mind and then invest that money bearing in mind you've got all that pressure on your shoulders from the owners yeah I, th- I think it can be difficult I think you need a you need a good team around you I'm sure Frank has but I, I'm sort of um, privy to certain conversations some football clubs ring me and ask for sort of character references on on players so they do a lot of research into so not they know how good he is they know what he brings on the pitch but they'll ring people like me that might have played with him that might know him how, how do you think he'll fit into this? What's he like when things aren't going great? You know, is there anything we need to be concerned about? So there's there's a lot that goes into signing a player, not just, oh, he's wonderful, he, he can beat four, four players and bend it in the top corner, That that's great. But is he going to fit into what we're building? Is he going to fit into the culture that we've got here at Chelsea or here at Liverpool or, or wherever it may be? Um, and also, the, 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 as, you, as you rightly say, the level of expectation goes up. Last year, Frank would had a transfer ban. He had a team of very young players that was sort of forced upon him because he couldn't sign anyone. And sort of fans were sort of writing off that season and anything he achieved was was going to be seen as a bonus. Whereas now he's spent 300 million or whatever it may be. Um, expectation levels are definitely going to rise and he's, he's, he's going to come under more pressure a, a, a lot more quickly than he did last season. Um but also, I think being being a legend as as Frank is at at Chelsea will will definitely buy you more time. You know, the fans will will stick with you that little bit longer rather than maybe someone that they they don't know and that they can't relate to quite as well. Um, so I, I'm sure I'm sure Frank will make it a success. But as you rightly say, having loads of money to spend doesn't necessarily mean you're 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 going to spend it wisely and it's going to be successful. Yeah, of course. Um, so I want to talk about next gen. Yes. Um, I know obviously you're a very, very busy man with your own family life, obviously personal life. Then you've got Liverpool job, which mm-hmm. is massive. I, I remember when it was announced a few months ago, which was very, very cool. Obviously media stuff. But then you're a businessman as well because you've invested into Next Gen. Yeah. Um, your business partner, uh, Damien McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, 
great chap. Spoke to him a few times. Uh-huh. Um, tell me a bit bit about Next Gen. What, what what is that all about? Yeah, so Next Gen, we're trying to provide um, sort of opportunities for kids in football. So um, sort of a grassroots section to it where they get to play in sort of Sunday league stuff, which is where I sort of found my way. And I loved playing for sort of a local team, Valley Valiants back then, who, who Damien also played for, actually. I played for Valley Valiants oh, did you? younger. So yeah. that's three of us. Yeah. So Damien yeah. was a couple of years above me, um, but we, we both played for Valley Valiants. Um, so there's that side of it where you get to play the grassroots. But then there's also a part of it, which is sort of the academy where you don't have to come and play for us. If you're happy where you are and you're settled, we don't want to disrupt that. But we offer you a service on a on a Thursday night or whatever it may be where you come along to us and we try and improve you as an individual, give you opportunities. We have good links with, with a lot of professional clubs. Chelsea have, have come and taken a, a lot of our players to their academy already. Um, so, yeah, it's I mean, and, and it all started really by me taking my little boy to to a, a football team near us and, and I was looking at it and thinking, no, I'm, I'm spending money and we're stood here for an hour and, I, and I'm not sure what he's really getting from it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm sure he'd get more out of spending half hour in the garden with me. You know, I'm, I'm qualified. And I, I spoke to Damien and he was sort of the, of the same thing. He was like, yeah, I, I know what you mean. So I just felt like there was better out there. So I had a little look around, couldn't find anything that I was comfortable going right, take my little boy, you're going to give him the best opportunity he can. Yeah. I, just, I, did, I didn't think it was there. So I said to Damien, why, why, don't, why don't we try and build something? You know, you've got a little boy who's a year older than me. Damien had already sort of started it in sort of small, a small sort of way in the under eights team um, for his boy. So I started the under sevens for my boy. Um, we managed to get sort of Nike on board, Pro Direct. Yeah. We managed to get some, Powerful, yeah, yeah. some fantastic facilities, some fantastic players. And then what we said was when you go to other places, you get dads that take the team on a, on a Sunday morning because obviously the, the budget at certain places is small and, and no offence to the dads out there, but, but they're not qualified. So I, I didn't want my little boy spending an hour of his time being coached by a, a dad when he, he could be coached by someone. So we've said that we're going to go UA for qualified coaches across, across the board, try and, try and every kid that comes to us, give them the best opportunity to be the best they can be and have a real focus on sort of the quality of it. Um, and and it, it's, go, it's going fantastically well and I'm extremely pleased with, with where we've got to. The feedback's been amazing. But being sort of the, the perfectionist and being sort of critical of everything I do, I'm still trying to push it forward and the, the levels are fantastic. You know, for, for grassroots football, the, the game I attended on Sunday... Uh, for our under seven and under eight team, the facilities, the Nike balls, the kit, the level of coaching, um, the level of performance is something I've never seen at, at grassroots football. I mean, I was never fortunate enough to get that sort of facility and service when I was that age. So the kids are are getting really well treated, but I still think we can push it on again. And obviously we're, we're very new. We're only a few months into it. So the, as fantastic as it is right now, it's still a still still a lot to go. So it's it's been a fantastic journey, and just seeing that we 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 won our match on Sunday and seeing the little kids' faces afterwards, you know, and and them having me on the side. I know I'm going to sound like I'm bigging myself up. I'm not, but to have the Liverpool under twenty three coach and a guy that's played six hundred professional games <coughs> taking your six year old for Sunday league football is like not very common you know it's, yeah. it's it's a fantastic opportunity for a lot of them yeah. and to see how they're developing and see how much they're enjoying it is, is give us give us a real pleasure so hopefully we can we can keep pushing it forward yeah and uh, what you what's your ambition with it is it to just to scale it and maybe eventually amalgamate it with another organization or yeah so there's some footballers already that have some of my friends in different parts of the country that have shown an interest and said you know maybe could we have a next gen could we open one down here and like call a franchise. it franchise? Sort of, yeah. So could we call it like next gen by the footballer? So maybe a one who's done well in Birmingham, that sort, that sort of thing. We're still, we haven't done any of that yet because I want to iron out all the little wrinkles that, I mean, it looks great still from the outside and we are providing a good service, but I want to make sure we've got it exactly where I want it. I, I want it running as smoothly as Liverpool runs, whether that's achievable, I, I don't know, mm. but that, that's where I've set the goals. Um, the staff that I deal with there can't quite believe the the standards that me and Damien demand of them, but it is that's where we want to get it to. So we'd like to get it. I'd like to get our little one to a place that we're happy with before we start letting it. But hopefully, hopefully we can provide next gen to to all the kids in in the country and give them the best chance of having a 
successful career like, like I was fortunate enough to have. Maybe you could pivot as well into maybe other sports as well if you get big enough. Yeah, my, my wife's just started netball. So she said, can we start a next yeah. year netball? I was like, well, it sounds all right. They both start with N. So it's, it's, it's a good start. So we're, we're, we'll maybe venture into netball soon. Lovely stuff. Um, so let's say beyond, like, let's say 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, have you got any other uh, like aspirations or, or goals? I know you obviously want to be in, in management, but yeah. let's say even beyond that, um, I always believe in like planning, you know, for, for the future, have a vision for the future for me and my family. Is there anything else outside of football that you want to do? Invest Not into really. other companies? Uh, yeah, no, I'd, I, 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 I want to be successful um, and I want to be able to provide a life for, for my children that, that is comfortable. I want them to be successful in their own right, but I want to get to a position where if they're not, they're okay. I can still look after them for their whole, for their whole life. Um, and, and I see myself growing old, owning a, a nice big villa in Portugal or somewhere and my kids and their kids, the grandkids all coming over on family holidays. So that, that that's where I see, that's, that's why I put in the work I put in to have these times. With, I love spending time with, with my family. Um, so obviously as I get older, I want to be in a position where I can say, I can still look after all of you and I, I can provide everything we need to, to be happy and secure. Um, and and that, that's always what's driven me really providing for providing for my family perfect stuff uh, where can people find you Gary if they want to follow you uh, so yeah uh, Gary O'Neill official on Instagram um, next gen football as well also on Instagram both also on Twitter um, and you can just drop me a message on there I, I sometimes respond if I get time I try and make them really interesting questions I respond to the interesting ones nice one All right. Um, my podcast is about motivation yep so I've got a bit of a quote, uh, which is be happy, never content. I've okay. got my own interpretation of it. Yep. If I were to ask you to say what your interpretation of be happy, never content is. Um, so sort of a, appreciate what you've got and where you are, but never settle that that, that, that that's where you're going to end up. Always strive for more. So it's not like you don't want to say, well, I'm not happy where I am because you're very fortunate to be where you are and you're more fortunate than a lot of people. If you're content, you're probably going to stand still and you're not looking to, to progress and develop. So it's, it's a good sound. I like it. I might use it. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> Cheers for your time, Gary. Thanks, mate. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Cheers. Cheers.